Tu, tu m'entends, oui C'est bon. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I will talk about uh, basically accessibility, so making Debian for everybody. Um, I will first um, give my usual talk about accessibility. So for people who are watching this, um, you can skip like 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and if you have already seen one of my talks, I mean, um, but for people here, maybe you, are, you haven't seen this already. Uh, can you tell me what the problem with this uh, for accessibility? Uh, yes? For blind people? Colorblind. Ah, for colorblind people. Colorblind. Yes, that's the problem. That's one of the problems. For blind people, well, there are versions, text versions of uh, GNUplot, uh, but for colorblind people, that's the most awful choice of colors because a lot of people just cannot distinguish between green and red. And then Gloop, GNUplot 5 uh, changed the colors and then it's all right. There were research about which colors are uh, distinguishable by most people. Some people cannot really um, distinguish anything at all, but at least this should work for really m much more people. The thing is, there are like 8% of people, of uh, male people, who are colorblind. Maybe here there are some colorblind people. R raise your hand if you are colorblind. There's nobody. Oh, that's strange because 8%, that's really a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is accessibility? Just to give um, a definition, so that means making it usable by everybody, so the title of the talk, including with some people with specific needs, whatever they are. Uh, of course, you would think about blind people because that's something that people see most often in the street or etc. But also people who have just low vision. There are a lot of people here who have low vision just because they have they need glasses, and glasses are actually an accessibility tool to compensate for the disability. And also people who are deaf, which who cannot hear what the computer maybe beeps or something like this, uh, colorblind as we have seen, uh, one-handed, typing control at backspace with just one hand. It's not possible, or you use an elbow, or I don't know. Um, some people with cognition issues, so if you make an interface which is really complex, then it's difficult, almost impossible for some people. Um, people with disabilities, motor disabilities, so typing on a keyboard is not something which is granted for everybody. And elderly people who basically have everything at the same time, um, unfortunately, all of us will get old at some point, and so we will have these problems. Uh, so we will be concerned at some point. But also, um, that might be you next month, just because you break your arm and that you only have one hand to type on the keyboard. Or maybe you are in the sunlight and you have your cell phone and you cannot actually see the screen. So being able to ask for really high contrast, high luminosity and things like this is something useful for everybody actually, because anybody can be in a disability situation. For more discussions about all of these, there, there are accessibility how-tos to have uh, more details about this. Um, so it can be you tomorrow. I hope it will, n it will not be, but that can happen. So it depends mostly on the situation uh, I don't know, some people in wheelchair won't have problem with using a, a PC. That's not a problem because they can type on it. Uh, and vice versa. Somebody can work but not use a PC because they don't have hands. So it really depends on what you want to do, the situation, what you have. Um, so it's not something simple. And something you have to know is that 10% of the people really believe they are handicapped. That's already a lot. And 20% of the people would say, in my daily life, I have concerns with using a PC, but uh, also opening a door or whatever. So it's really a lot of people who are concerned with accessibility. Um, for software, I would argue that this is all about freedom zero, because 
as was proposed by Stallman, the freedom zero is to run the program for any purpose. Okay, but running is a good thing, but being able to use it is even better. Um, we've discussed about it with Richard. He said no. For me, it is really the ability to run that is a legal ability. And okay, that's because it's licensing terms, etc. But then, for a social um, uh, and ethical question, uh, we want to let people use the software, of course. Then Richard said, okay, but it's not a requirement, it can be a feature, etc. Um, if you're excluding some people from your software because they cannot use it, that's really a concern. Um, he said, okay, but then you can modify the software. The problem is that the people who cannot even use your software, would they, would, would they really be able to modify it? For blind people, if they cannot see the screen, they cannot make it accessible. It's not possible. For instance, our work on the Debian installer was not possible to do by a blind person because unless it is accessible, he cannot work with it. Um, so we have to implement this. Uh, we have to care about this and not just think people who need it will just implement it. That will not happen. So long text, um, just to show a few things. So the UNO defines something, discrimination on the, basic, uh, on the basis of disability. That means um, dis uh, exclusion, restriction, uh, with the effect of impairing exercise of human rights and fundamental freedom, so it's big things, including denial of reasonable ac accommodation. So that means that not making the little effort to make your software accessible is actually considered as discrimination. It's not something active, you're not excluding somebody actively, but by not doing something and by writing some software which a lot of people can use but a few people cannot use, you're actually excluding them from um, something. And when it's about social uh, things, for instance, I don't know, social networks, uh, social websites, it's really a concern for those people. And of course, reasonable accommodation is really vague. They make some, um, pre some, some uh, details, not imposing a disproportionate or undue burden. Okay, it's not much more clear. It's left to people to decide what they think about this. Okay, so let's present a bit um, about the hardware because some people don't know necessarily about this. Um, so Braille, of course, is something that people know about because they have heard ab about it. Um, it's quite rare to use Braille, actually, because a lot of people don't know Braille. So they would use pitch synthesis, so the um, computer would say the words that uh, it wants to express. Um, conversely, for the user, he, f he cannot type on, on the keyboard uh, or use a mouse, where they can use a joystick um, or just a button that they press or just have their eyes moving and blinking the eye to actually click on something because it cannot move anything at all. So this is just a, uh, a few elements. There are, of course, a lot of different hardware pieces that can be used for different um, disabilities. Um, one important thing to understand is that you should never focus on one technology. For Braille, as I've said, a lot of people cannot read, read Braille. So you cannot say it's accessible because it's Braille. No. Uh, and also, Braille devices are, are extremely expensive. i would show this. And conversely, speech synthesis is not perfect either. Uh, because sometimes you're in a noisy room. Um, also, just hearing, to just listening to something doesn't give you the spelling. So it's for, for, for people who really need to have the spelling for programming, for instance, uh, speech synthesis is really not convenient at all. So for Braille, um, so this is a Braille cell. Uh, so we have little dots which are moving up and down. I can show you, I have one in, in my bag. Um, the idea is that we have a piezo bars which push uh, the, the dots. And so we put some of them together to form a line of, of cells, and then we connect to the PC with USB, serial, etc. So you would like have 20 uh, or 40 
cells along each other, and then it costs 150 times the number of cells, euros, typically. So for 40, it's like, yes, 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 several thousand euros, so it's awfully expensive. Okay, so that was for hardware, and then for software, um, one thing which is important to understand is that writing dedicated software is usually a bad idea. Uh, so for instance, there is EDBrowse, which was meant to be a browser for blind people, uh, but then they don't support JavaScript, they don't support CSS, etc. There are a lot of things that they would have to implement, um, and there's not enough manpower to do this. Um, so just make the existing application accessible. So Firefox, of course, to make it accessible is a lot of work, but it's less work than rewriting the whole JavaScript support, etc. Uh, so just use the same software. There is also a social reason for this, is that if you have your own software and your uh, neighbor, your colleague, whatever, uses another software, then he cannot help you and you cannot help him on something. And that actually excludes people in the workplace or school's place if you are not using the same software. So that's also one reason to, to use just the same software. <coughs> so concerning Debian, so we are a distribution. There is also a trap there, even if you are using the same software, um, there shouldn't be any distrib uh, specialized distribution because the problem of accessibility is really orthogonal to any kinds of concerns about using a computer. Um, so for instance, the idea of blends and tasks are really orthogonal to this because there is, for instance, um, a, a task for, uh, I don't know, medicine, and then there can be blind people who work on medicine and same for music and whatever. So this is really something that has to be implemented for all of this. Um, and also, also, of course, when you write a specialized distribution, then you think about your own needs or the needs you are imagine about the people who are using it, and you are not thinking globally. And maybe your distribution will work well for a blind person, for instance, but not well for somebody with just low vision. And so in the end, we are duplicating efforts between blind distributions, low vision distributions, etc. So that's not a good idea. I'm not saying that we should completely ban such kinds of distributions because, because they are really helpful as test beds. They can try uh, new things, new screen readers, new uh, technologies, just to see how well it works, interact with users, and then once we have something which is stable, we can try to push them to mainline distributions. And then it's available uh, globally. So for me, really, the, the aim is that we have accessibility available everywhere. I'm not saying enabled everywhere, just available. A library, an airport, practice room, etc. Just because you don't want to have to ask for the sysadmin to install some software so that you can use the software, the, 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 the computer. Uh, for instance, at the airport, there's no way you can find an admin sys. At a school, yes. The admin sys is not so far away, but he doesn't have the time to do it, etc. Uh, if the distribution does this for everybody by default, then yes, it's available. So the idea is just, it's installed by default, ready for use, and you just have to press a uh, shortcut or plug something or whatever to actually trigger uh, enabling the, the support. So for instance, in the Debian installer, that's what happens. When you have the boot prompt, you can type S, enter, and then you have speech. If you have Braille device, you just plug your Braille device via USB, and then the Debian installer knows, oh, you need to use a Braille device, let's enable support for this. And then it's, it's really um, it's done for the Debian installer part. Um, so just to give a global overview on the accessibility support in the uh, free software. So text mode is not really a problem, uh, but the problem is just that it's not for beginners. A lot of people would say, but yeah, there's text uh, mode things and that's fine. It is fine for technical people, it's not for beginners. 
Um, so there's graphical mode. So GNOME has a lot of support, so GTK applications, notably, are quite well accessible. We had an issue with GNOME 3 because they rewrote a lot of things and then a lot of things were lost uh, concerning accessibility. The thing is, we are really late compared to Windows, which, has, uh, which started the work a lot, uh, a lot of time before us. And compared to Apple, we are at Stone Age. Just because Apple uh, really made the effort to integrate accessibility into their product. Uh, so it's unfortunate, but a lot of people in the blind communities say, just buy Apple stuff because it will work. And you cannot say, no, you should use free software. I, I cannot use it. I will use Apple. That's a concern. And that's one of the reasons which are starting to um, convince Richard Stallman that it has to be a priority, actually. So this is how it, look like, how it looks like. Um, so we have an application here uh, which uh, has an abstract re representation of the content of the application from which it does the visual render un rendering, the usual rendering. But then also a screen reader here can access to that representation through a bus and then it can render this on an accessibility device, be it braille, speech, something else. That's the idea. It's really generic. You don't have to know when you're writing here your abstract representation, how it will be rendered for the user. Um, so how it looks like in practice, so you have the X server uh, where there is the rendering, the usual rendering done by Pango. But then GTK also ex uh, exposes the content through ATK. And then the screen reader here, Orca, can get the text and then push that to Braille and speech. So it's called ATSPI, the bus uh, which is between the screen reader and the application. Um, con in, in real terms, what happens is that Orca asks ATK, give me the text, and then ATK provides the text. And Conversely, ATK notifies Orca when there is a modification. So Orca doesn't have to poll every millisecond or, or something. And that only happens when a screen reader is running. So it's not a problem to make accessibility available. It doesn't slow down application. When it's enabled, yes, there is more uh, things to do here. But uh, enabling it, uh, um, just making it available doesn't cost. Um, one giveaway slide uh, for programmers. The idea is that you shouldn't think about the graphical in, uh, user interface, but the logical user interface. It's just like CSS and HTML. You have you the structure of your page, and then you have CSS to lay out things, etc. Uh, so when you're writing a dialog box, just put the elements logically, and then the screen reader will be able to do its job. Um, take care <coughs> of widgets. Just use the standard widgets provided by the toolkit. So for instance, if you have text with a label, there is the labeled text field, which includes both, and that is correctly uh, interpreted by the, the screen reader. If you really have to write your own widget, then you have to implement the ATK part to expose the information that you have in your widget. And at any rate, you have to always provide a textual alternative to whatever you are showing to the user. So if you have an icon, an image, s whatever, which is not text, then you have to provide an alternative text. Even if it's a standard widget, well, you have to provide the, that standard widget with uh, the text for it. And Key tips simple. That's something that people repeat just for common sense. Uh, it's especially important for people with cognitive issues. So if you make something simple, they will be able to use the software. That will also be useful for everybody because then the software is nicer to use because it's more simple. Uh, so in the end, it's interesting to do this. OK, so that was they uh, talk about accessibility in general. Now I will be talking about Debian in particular. Um, so the Debian accessibility team 
uh, was founded quite a long time ago. <coughs> um, so just to give the resources, so there's a slide, so you can have it on, on the website to have the pointers. So we have an IOC channel, we have a mailing list for discussions, a mailing list for bug reports and uploads, notifications, etc. We have the um, the marketplace, let's say, for the BN accessibility, which explains the goals of the team, etc. And then there is the workplace. So there are three wiki pages. The first is for users, the blind people, deaf people, etc. The people who actually need accessibility, so they need to know how it works, what configuration they can have, etc. Then there is development uh, wiki for people who are implementing things in Debian accessibility. And there's a third one which is for maintainers in Debian. That is, that's a page which is meant to be between the accessibility team and the other teams of Debian, or whatever developer who is interested in uh, thinking about accessibility. Um, so that's why we have these three pages. They really have different targets. Um, so of course, the accessibility team uh, works on packaging, uh, at least to drive the specific hardware that we have seen, so um, for speech and braille. Um, then there, there are the software drivers, so implementations of assistance tools, uh, so, for instance, speech synthesis, software speech synthesis, or recognition. Um, for Braille, we have a lot of tools to actually translate Braille, emboss Braille, uh, recognize Braille. Uh, there are a lot of things. And then there's a lot of things that can be implemented. So, zooming the screen, changing the colors, um, handling the keyboard in, in another way so that if you type a key several times because you have a Parkinson issue, then it's not a problem, etc. So there are a lot of things at the software layer which can be uh, packaged. Then there is the screen reading stack. So I've talked about it, ATSPI. Uh, so we have a few packages uh, to implement this. So Orca is the screen reader. And then there are a lot of ATSPI something packages which implement the link between the screen reader and the applications. Then we have a couple of software which are dedicated to um, people with disabilities. So for instance, uh, for reading books, uh, daisy books, e-books, we have software for this. It makes sense to make a dedicated software in this case um, because they have really a special rendering uh, of, the, of the content. Um, it could be discussed that it should be shared well. For now, it's like this. We have to do's in the wiki page. Um, not all the packages we would like to package uh, have been done uh, because we don't have so much, so many people working on this. So if you can help, there is already uh, work to do here, and also backports, for instance, um, for drivers. Of course, when we have a new Braille device, then old. Uh, releases of Debian are missing the drivers. So we are doing some backports of um, Braille TTY at least to be able to drive these. So that was packaging, but that's one of the things which is not so complex I I in a way. The more complex thing is discussing with other teams to integrate accessibility into the distribution, really. Uh, so first, I've I will talk about the installer because historically that's one of the things that we have done <coughs> and it took a long time to get where we are. Um, but then there are a lot of things that we, we could do and we have done some of the things and some others we would like to do. It's a matter of doing uh, the discussion. So let's talk about the installer. So the Debian boot mailing list basically. Um, supporting accessibility within the Debian installer means supporting Braille speech, high contrast, so that's what we have implemented so far. Um, one thing we would like to do is having um, making the graphical installer accessible, but that means putting the ATSPI stack into the installer, 
running the screen reader Orca, which is based on Python. Uh, Python is not in the Debian installer yet, uh, so there's still work to do. Um, just to discuss on these, it takes some space on the Debian installer image. So for instance, speech is not available on the smallest image because the voices for speech take quite some uh, space. And so it's available on only on the graphical images, which is fine enough. It's, it's a compromise between, we would like to make everything accessible, etc. Okay, but at some point, uh, we have to choose because, for instance, mini ISOs, which are supposed to be just like a couple of uh, dozens megabytes big, we cannot put speech on these. It's not uh, possible technically. Okay, let's make a compromise. Um, then there is a question of bootstrapping. That's not something that y you would think about uh, at first. If you start the Debian installer, so you insert the CD, you press on, and then you have boot menu. And if the user doesn't know that the boot menu is showing up on the screen, he doesn't know that it has he has to press enter. So it took quite some time to make the discussion to just add a beep at that point. And there were, there were discussions just because, okay, but then that's a beep that can disturb all the people, etc. And you cannot skip that step, discussing with Debian boot to find a compromise that Debian boot accepts. And what's more interesting, we'll defend. It happened like, I don't know, one or two years after we implemented this, a user complained that there is a beep at the boot menu. And I thought, okay, we will have to restart the whole discussion. And no. What happened is that the Debian boot people themselves explained, no, we need this because this and that. Cool. That means that the Debian accessibility team didn't need to do anything anymore about that point. It's integrated, really understood. You cannot skip that part. And then that's for good. Um, so that was the beep at the boot prompt. And of course, uh, when you have a USB thing, you, just you can just plug and then that part doesn't need a compromise. That's fine, you can plug something. Uh, it doesn't disturb the normal way of installing Debian. So that's fine. Um, a discussion that happened uh, in the latest releases was the choice of the default desktop. We were happily surprised that Debian, poop, Debian boot people um, took care of choosing a desktop which is accessible. Because yes, what is the best default? Is it, is it the, the, the most uh, technically advanced desktop? For Debian, which is about uh, diversity and making the world better, etc. No, it means everybody can use it. So it makes sense to choose uh, a div uh, an accessible desktop. Maybe not the most accessible in that technically uh, accessible, uh, but that is som something that everybody can use. Mm? So the discussion was basically between GNOME and MATE because others have problems, KD wasn't ready at the time, etc. Um, in the end, I think we chose GNOME because it had zooming support integrated, while MATE didn't. Even if MATE has less glitches, accessibility glitches than uh, GNOME, it GNOME has wider support. So that's why we chose it. Um, so that was for installing. Um, there's Live CD, which is quite next to, to it in terms <coughs> of uh, distribution. Um, there is some support in the Live CD. Apparently, you can press uh, Meet or Alt S to start the screen reader. It seems to work. Uh, there is probably some tuning to do in there. Um, and Bootstrap support, we have it with uh, Meta Alt S. I don't think plugging <coughs> a Braille device will enable Braille automatically, so there are things to do here. We have to discuss with the Live CD people, again, to make sure that things are integrated and not just patched over and get skipped at some point because they don't understand it. They don't understand why, uh, how, etc. Um, then there is the technical part uh, for desktop accessibility. So toolkits for f first, so GTK, Qt, etc. 
so what we need is making sure that the toolkits are uh, accessible. So that's the ATK part I mentioned before, um, to make them accessible via the bus, accessibility bus. So for a long time, this wasn't enabled by default. That means you install Debian and it's not enabled. You have to configure something so that it works. Um, last DebConf um, in, in, um, in Germany, uh, so not, not the very last, but the one I was at, I said maybe we should enable it by default, so available by default, and then you just start the screen reader. And we did it. We, start, we enabled it, and uh, there were some regressions, but we, but we took the time to fix the bugs, and eventually in Debian 9 we have GTK 2, 3, and Qt 4, 5, and Java accessible. So it didn't go without problems, but at least now it's achieved, and I hope we won't revert this. Um, so that covers basically most applications, not all of them, unfortunately. Um, so for instance, TK, so from Tickle TK, is not accessible. There are quite a few applications which are, which are really useful. I don't know, like JITK or things like this. Uh, so it, will be it would be really nice to have accessibility support there. A GNU step is not accessible. SDL is difficult to think about because it's not really a toolkit. Probably we won't be able to do accessibility there. And then there are the old ones. Um, I, I've left any kind of hope that these will be made accessible, unfortunately. But in practice, that's not so much a concern. Um, then there are the desktops. It's not the, the same question. Of course, for a desktop to be accessible, it needs to use a toolkit which is accessible. But then you have to make sure that the bus, the accessibility bus, does work. So does, how does it work? We actually have a D-bus um, bus. So in you have a notion of D-bus session. And then you have ATSPI daemons, which start at the start of um, the desktop session and which discuss via D-bus. And that's something that if your desktop is not so well uh, doing things properly, uh, there's a problem there and it, it doesn't work. So normally it just works by this file, uh, so an XDG auto start file, and then if the desktop respects XDG, then it does work. It didn't always work, um, but at, at the moment, uh, the ones we tested, it seems to be working. There's a th second thing, so accessibility is working. Okay, good. But then you need a way to bootstrap, as I've said. That is, you have a, a computer which is already started, and you want to enable really the screen reader. You need a shortcut for this. So GNOME decided to use sup Super Alt S. Hopefully, other desktops will just use the same shortcut, so that it's just the same documentation for all kinds of computer. Just press this, and then you have a screen reader. Really, I hope that someday, whatever the computer, you just press this, and then you have speech. That would be really great. Um, so how do you test this? You have a little JIT repository for this. You have some, uh, some environment uh, variables to uh, set to enable accessibility in, in these. And then make check. We'll check that these are actually working. And if it, it doesn't work, there's a script which shows you which technical elements are not working precisely. So to be able to, to start understanding what is missing. You can also start Orca-L to check whether the screen reader is able to see the list of applications. I'm not saying that you should try to use a screen reader, etc., because there's a learning curve uh, for this. But at least you can run this to check that it seems to be working. OK, so back with desktops. It's not finished because you have display managers. So before getting to a desktop, you have this. You have to type your login password. If it's not accessible, people cannot log in. Uh, so again, you have to make the ATSPI bus working, have a way to start the screen reader, and so that somebody enters a practice room at the university or whatever, take whatever computer, press the shortcut, and then 
can start working, logging, uh, get to uh, a desktop, start things, etc. Um, so for all of this, uh, Simon Keynes started something which is not official yet. Um, it seems to be working quite nice, not for everything, but at least we have some beginning of something that could be tested automatically to check that for all kinds of uh, desktops uh, in Debian, uh, things are working right. Uh, so probably we would like to include this in the quality assurance page uh, at some point when it's st considered sta stable enough uh, so that developers actually see a red light saying there's something wrong wi with your package. Accessibility wise, okay, let's talk with accessibility people, we will see what is uh, going wrong. So that at least people, uh, not accessibility people, but other developers uh, are aware of the issue and, and they would be um, looking for this first before asking for help um, from Debian accessibility people. Um, there are a lot of other things I could talk about, uh, just to give a few items. Um, so I've talked about the desktop, the login screen, but before that there's the boot menu. So I mean grub, things like this. Ideally we would have accessible grub. Uh, there is work happening in grub uh, about this. Uh, it's progressing slowly. Maybe at some point we could have it. Um, there's one interesting alternative, which is uh, a petty boot, which is a small boot program which runs in userland. That means that you have a first bootloader which is not accessible, which loads just a Linux kernel to just run petty boot with a screen reader, and then this one you can actually uh, access a boot menu, and then you press enter and it starts another kernel and the real system. Um, so that could be an ID to integrate in the distribution automatically. Um, so that was for uh, the um, technical parts. Then there is all the really uh, community parts. So for instance, debugs, so the bug tracking system, uh, recently got uh, an accessibility tag, which is really interesting for us to be able to track easily which bugs are a concern for Debian accessibility, etc. Because of course, accessibility bugs are not only in the package that we maintain, but in other packages. I don't know, for instance, in Firefox, when you were moving to the end of the page with a Braille device, then the cursor would go out of the screen and you wouldn't see on the screen what the user is actually reading. And that's not a problem for the user, but for the people who are working with him, that's a problem. And that was a bug in Firefox. And we are interested in tracking this, so we added the um, accessibility tag, so we are uh, aware of when it is fixed, etc. Um, concerning the release, we could suggest that accessibility bugs could be considered uh, release critical. Uh, of course, that has to be discussed, etc. Um, that means if it's a bug which makes the user, uh, the user um, less efficient, okay, it's not really critical. But, but if pr it presents somebody from using a computer, that's really, really critical because somebody is excluded from being able to use a computer. So that could be considered. Yeah? So just to repeat the beginning, yes. so you agree that... I agree with you, th we should, all, all, yeah. all accessibility bugs should be really critical. Th but it's, it's a project that discussion. The problem is that you cannot delay a release for whatever bugs, accessibility bugs. So that has to be discussed. Yes, and then you say regressions should be really critical. Ideally, yes. At some point, probably it will happen that we say, okay, too bad. That again, that's to be discussed. We cannot set rules and et, et cetera. I cannot emphasize more. Always we have to discuss with teams. Okay, then there are debt tags. So for people who doesn't 
know that. Um, so debt tax or tax put on packages to know things about the, 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 the package. What does it do, how it is implemented, what kind of interface it, it provides, etc. So something which was added was the tax accessible with, so it's available now, and then we need to put to actually put them on packages so that we have a set of packages, okay, but a lot of them are not accessible, a lot of them are accessible. For people with disabilities, they don't know yet which one is or not, and it's really a pain to have a start menu, good, a lot of applications, and then you find that, no, this is not accessible, okay, I take another one, this is not, ah. If we can have a set which was really tested as accessible, then we could implement something which only shows the uh, applications which are accessible for a given kind of uh, accessibil accessibility technology. Because some applications could be usable with Braille but not with speech or vice versa. So we have to uh, put tags there. And then there is a lot of documentation that we should put somewhere. Um, so the developer reference and your maintainer's guide, so to explain these things have shown the accessibility bus so that they know, they are aware of these kind of issues. Uh, the importance of this, maybe there could be some bits in the Debian policy uh, about accessibility. I don't know yet. I just thinking maybe there are some things we could uh, think about. We should talk with derivatives just to explain them, because it's good to make the Debian ins installer accessible, but if derivatives actually break this because they don't understand how it is working, etc., then our aim is lost. We would like to make all derivatives accessible, and ideally they don't have to do any work about this. Maybe they need to know about some things so they don't disable, for instance, the beep, because they say, oh, it's no, you have to keep it, it's important. Okay. That's the kind of the documentation probably we have to do yet. And then one thing also for DevConf, so we are at DevConf, making sure that they are accessible. Uh, so some work has already been done, uh, I know, uh, just at least because some people have asked for it. Um, but making sure that they are settled in, in the documentation, etc., so that even if nobody is asking for it, it's available. And if somebody just comes without telling before, then okay, fine, it's already ready. The uh, building is ac accessible, uh, we have recording, we have text versions of the material, etc. Um, one thing I would like to emphasize, it's a big issue. Uh, I didn't have time to even answer on the list about it because I don't know how to solve it it's sound support um, in the console. The thing is, Pulse Audio people th say that you shouldn't run Pulse, Pulse Audio as root. Okay, but then the problem is that um, the screen reader is running as root, usually. It has to run before you log in, because if you don't have a screen reader to be able to log in, you cannot log in. Um, so there's con there are conflicting things here, and uh, we have to, again, discuss with them to find something. Um, the kinds of issues we've been having is it doesn't just doesn't work, or we have concurrency on the soundboard between the screen reader for the text console and the screen reader in the graphical console, things like this. So we really need help here from people who actually understand Pulse Audio, Alsa, etc., and to make sure that we have something which works. For now, it doesn't really work. So that's really a concern. Last but not least, how to get involved. Uh, so, <laughs> as usual, just join the list, etc. Uh, the problems we see is that people would say, I don't know how that is supposed to work. Accessibility, I don't know anything about it, etc. I didn't know about it when I started. I just learned uh, on the way uh, up to here. They would say, I don't know the needs. And that's indeed something which is difficult to understand what is actually needed how the user are actually using the computer etc that's a, a long learning uh, i've been working on these kind of things for like 15 years S i've been discussing with uh, some people for a long time so now i'm quite an expert on this 
Uh, and I cannot say that you can magically become an expert. That's fine. Just come on the list and discuss. And we can find ways, and even I don't always have uh, correct thinking, and I, I keep asking the users, how do you think it could work? Could this work? Could that work? And, and things like this. A common uh, misunderstanding is I don't have the hardware. I don't have Braille device. I don't have speech synthesis. That's not a problem. We have virtual things for all of these. So virtual Braille device we have. Uh, speech synthesis can be software speech synthesis. So that's not a concern. A last thing, I don't know how to actually test uh, how it works. So we did document how to test the Debian installer, for instance, with Braille, speech, etc. Uh, for other kinds of applications, so we have a list of mm, software that we maintain in Debian accessibility. What is missing is to document how to test them. For a few of them, we have done it, uh, but for quite a few of them, it's not done yet. And so I really welcome people either who are al already using it and then just document, or you are not using it, but OK, let's take time to try to use it and then discuss maybe uh, with users and then write something. And I mean, I don't know how to use this either, so I, I would just take the same time as you um, to do this. So you can come and try. So to conclude, Quite a few users need accessibility in all kinds of situations. So we want to make accessibility mainstream so it's available everywhere, uh, just ready to get enabled. So join the list, read accessibility main because that's the one normally, probably, all developers and maintainers should uh, know about. Uh, so you're welcome. Thanks. And I welcome questions, of <coughs> course. What is the meaning of the sign of the top left Guess. Corner? Debian? Yeah. <laughs> I'm here still uh, not so long this evening, uh, but then tomorrow I'm there the whole day long, so you can come and discuss. Thanks. <laughs>